really excited to be presenting here. I'm actually going to present something I've never quite presented on before, but that's sort of been building up inside me as something that I'm completely freaked out about. It's you know, fairly new developments in the law and uh, things that I'm pretty scared of, but also at the same time feeling hopeful about because we've been taking some action around them this year. Um, so I'm going to start us off uh, by introducing my new least favorite word, which I wasn't even sure how to pronounce the word. I think it's putrescible. It looks like putrescible, putrescible. Anyways, it's a terrible sounding word. I hate this word. Uh, I'd never heard it before. Uh, but usually if I come across a word that sounds terrible, looks terrible, and I don't know what it means, it's probably because I'm reading the law. And that is indeed the case. Um, this, this is what this word makes me think of. It's like a, a word that's covered in green slime. And basically what it means is something is putrescible if it's capable of becoming putrid. Um, and so recently I was, I was in a, a meeting with some go a government bureaucrat and some farmers. And basically the government bureaucrat was talking about how, you know, it's a really important health concern, putrescibles. We really need to protect people from them. And um, anyways, in a second, I'll tell you about this farmer over here on the right. Because you, you can see he's not enjoying this conversation. <laughs> but a little bit of background to how I ended up in the room with these folks is that Sustainable Economies Law Center, we have these walk-in legal advice clinics. And over the years, we've been doing this for six years. We've advised 1,000 micro enterprises and grassroots groups in the Bay Area. We've had a lot of groups come in and talk about different ways that they're composting and often gathering organic material from one place, transporting it, composting it somewhere else, creating really rich soil. And it's always like, wow, that's a brilliant thing. That's beautiful. And then I started to research the laws and I realized, oh gosh, there are a lot of laws at every la like layer of government. They're all different and they're actually really changing very quickly. So, so we started a project on compost law and policy. And one of our projects has involved um, getting urban farmers and composters and just other concerned people together on a monthly basis to have discussions about it in Oakland. So here we are at this discussion. We actually invited somebody from a city. I won't say which one. Anyways, um, actually a really nice guy. But yeah, he's talking about how we really need to protect people from putrescibles, Ugh, that word. Anyways, but then this farmer, he's like really quiet. He's looking down. And all of a sudden, he's like, you know what? I have this rage building up inside of me right now because what you're talking about, this thing that you're saying we need to protect us from, that is life. That is the source of all life. And here's somebody who's like every day harvesting things, composting things, putting rich compost back into the soil, cares so deeply about the soil and about the health of the soil. And so this was a really insightful moment for me too because I was kind of sitting there being like, oh yeah, putrescible, that's scary. But yeah, putrescibles, everything in life is putrescible if it's capable of rotting, basically. So another way to say putrescible is life. It's just life and the source of life to the extent that it decomposes and creates more life. In any case, so uh, here's some of my dramatic um, PowerPoint imagery. So that's the top of a carrot there, which there's, there's different ways to rot a carrot, basically, is what I've learned. And yeah, there are ways that that can cause public health concerns, but there's also ways that can really build up the life in our soils. And so yeah, carrots can be reborn as new carrots or other things, or they could rot. Um, oh, that's the scariest looking carrot I've ever drawn. Um, but yeah, so I mean, a little bit of legal history. Um, you know, public health laws have largely been about, you know, getting this rotten stuff out of our streets, protecting us from it. So for a long time, it was like, let's just get that out of our cities and we'll put it in landfills. And then later on, we realized what happens when you put it in landfills is when you put organic stuff in landfills and you trap it in there without any air, it creates methane. And I've recently learned that methane is about four times worse than carbon or anyways, it's way, way worse than carbon as far as, as greenhouse gases. So... So yeah, they're building up these gas bubbles in the landfills. So now the new, the new word is from the state of California, SB 1383, is, okay, never mind, never mind. All right, we have to get all of the organics out of landfills. So cities, so basically we're creating these mandates on cities to create systems to get all organics out of landfills. So what's happening? 
So what's happening is that cities are taking this mandate from the state and saying, okay, we gotta do this big thing right now. How are we gonna do it? And they tend to end up privileging large-scale solutions to getting organics out of, our, out of our site, out of our cities. And so that means giving exclusive contracts to big companies, having them take it away, and this is becoming a problem. So here's the new life for the top of a carrot, carrot top, is it's going into a big dumpster, then into a big truck, and then into a big pile, and then later it's ending up in a big bag of stuff. And stuff is kind of like the nice way of putting it. Other ways of putting it that I've heard, um, as far as like, what is the quality of the quote unquote compost that some of these big large scale compost facilities are creating? This is what some farmers have told me, that it's lifeless, you put hydrogen peroxide on it, it doesn't even bubble, like there's just no life in there. One farmer told me he had to pick drywall out of it before he could put it on his farm. Actually, he said, no, I didn't put it on the farm. <laughs> but yeah, he said, other people have said it's full of plastic. One person said it killed part of my garden. And I was like, how, how does it kill part of your garden? And then I realized, oh, how, you know, how is this stuff actually coming back and poisoning us? Well, as, you, as you've probably been talking about all day, and as we all know, there's a lot of bad chemicals we're putting in our food already, herbicides and whatnot, and this is ending up in the compost as well. So it is killing our gardens in some cases. It's not always poison, but it seems like in some cases it is. So then, so this is the crazy thing, is that this thing that is life and that is able to give us life is actually now being put into a system where it becomes dead and also deadly. And then the other thing is, it's like, well, we, now we have realized that putting compost on rangelands, for example, helps to sequester carbon. So there's a lot of excitement about that. I'm excited about that. But if we're going to be putting that stuff all over our rangelands, it's like we're covering the state of California in toxic plastic and drywall and, and stuff. So uh, the good news is, some good news, is that people are doing a lot of really great things at the local level to do, you know, create craft compost that's carefully stewarded. Here in Oakland, I made a list. This is not even a complete list of some of the creative ways that people are taking the organic matter and recycling it back into our soil. It's beautiful stuff, and um, a lot of urban farms, a lot of local food entrepreneurs involved. Um, that's the good news, is that it's happening. The bad news is, it's all illegal. Everything on that list right there is illegal, because here's what the Oakland Municipal Code says, which is that it's unlawful for any person other than the licensed hauler in Oakland, which is, well, there's three of them, but the main one is Waste Management, a giant Texas-based corporation, biggest waste management corporation in the US, um, that only that corporation is allowed to collect and haul organic materials from any premise within the city. So <laughs> anyways, yeah, and there are a few exam exemptions which are really useless, like you can collect coffee grounds and feed them to, I don't know what, you know, feed, you could use coffee grounds as feedstock. Um, so that's Oakland. Oakland is a little bit of an extreme example, but it's, it's an example that I'm afraid other cities are beginning to follow because in many ways, Oakland was ahead of the game. It was starting to create integrated uh, organic waste hauling before other cities, uh, but now other, every city, every county has to do it. And we're seeing cities all over the state start to create their own laws around it. There's this group in San Diego that reaches out to me on an average of like every four months and says, all right, some agency has just contacted us and told us we're breaking the law. And they are incredible. They have overcome five legal barriers over the course of the last two years, and they're operating. They're up and running. They're creating rich soil. They have members that are receiving that soil throughout San Diego. But that's just like, that's way too many hurdles to have to jump over. Um, so I mean, this is like a horror movie. Sometimes I feel like that this could be like some sort of like, yeah, horror movie, nightmare, I don't know what, but it's like where, where you think you know what the enemy is. It's like, we gotta protect ourselves from these putrescibles. They create methane. It's, you know, we gotta do something about this. And then what do we do is we create this system where it's illegal to do anything with organic matter other than put it in big trucks and send it out of the city. So I know that looks a little bit extreme, 
it is maybe a little extreme right now because I don't know of an example of police coming out like that. But you know that police have shown up in riot gear around violations of agricultural laws in other contexts. So I wouldn't be surprised. Plus, waste management, gigantic corporation, you know, connected to the government, blah, blah, blah. So, so this is like this nightmare we've created for ourselves. OK, am I going to get to the good news? Yeah, OK, so what can we do to protect our right to basically steward life? Uh, well, the time to do it is right now, of all times, because this is the time when cities and states, cities, counties, everywhere, regulatory agencies are creating laws right now around composting. So we're about to basically have loads of laws dumped on us, but rather than kind of have them sort of, sort of passively be dumped on, uh, rather than be dumped on, we can be out there actively shaping these laws. And so as I was realizing how many different legal issues were coming up and how many different laws were being written at once, I mean, there's a lot just in California all at once. I couldn't even keep track of them. I said, all right, let's start having these monthly gatherings. We, we initially called it the Soil Policy Team, thinking, be a, thinking it would be a sort of a group of people who get together every month uh, and sort of work through some steps toward doing some advocacy. Ultimately, it's become a little bit more like a party where every month somebody different comes and people are always coming in and out and different people are learning, but it has been a great experience. These soil policy parties, as we now call them, they still happen every fourth Wednesday. You're welcome to come. But even better, I would actually suggest doing something like this yourself because every city, like I said, is a little different and you need to be addressing it at the local level. But this is the formula we use for the soil policy parties, which is, um, and we've been doing this since January, uh, we, we have dinner. We have a little story time where we just sort of go around, anybody share any random interesting fact about soil, farming, compost, whatever they want to share. Uh, and then we do some kind of legal detective work. We've read Supreme Court cases, we've read statutes, we've given input on draft regulations, uh, we've actually brought a couple scientists in to help us understand the science of it a little better, we've collected data. Um, so we do this kind of like legal hackathon, legal detective work, scavenger hunt type of activity, which is fun even for me as a lawyer, because I do this all the time. When I'm sitting in the room with other people and I'm reading a law, they'll see something different in the law that I did not see, and we, would, we just have insights right and left. Like I'm always like writing down all these insights during these parties that I had not actually gained myself, and people bring so much knowledge into the room, it's incredible. Um, and none of these people are, pe are lawyers or anyone with a background in law. They're all mostly farmers. And then at the end of the evening, we try to make something, take action, whether it's reach out to a local city, something. We just try to have something tangible come of it. So, and this is kind of part of our underlying ethic as an organization, which is just that everyone is a policymaker and that everybody really should not only like vote in elections and participate in that way, but actually become an active creator, instigator of policy campaigns and to actively give input in policies as they're being made. Because, I, yeah, and this is kind of how I started. Law is not just this, you know, set of confusing words like putrescible. It's law is us. It is our agreement about how we want to live. And right now we need to make clear what is our agreement about what we want to do with life, life, organic matter, and the source of life, and the people who are best, um, best positioned to make the rules about life and organic matter are the people who are touching it every day. It's the farmers, the food entrepreneurs, and so on. Not lawyers, because I did not learn this stuff in law school. And really, there's a lot of different ways to be involved. We've We've actually had an impact simply by writing letters to regulators and saying, uh, can you change this thing or can you interpret this for us because it doesn't make sense. And we've actually tried to introduce leg legislation. We've opposed legislation or helped amend legislation. There's sort of a, a variety of ways that you can get involved. Um, and over the years, Sustainable Economies Law Center has been involved in a lot of, a lot of policy making efforts on a lot of different issues. Um, and yeah, it's just really empowering. And I didn't really have any experience doing this, but it's when you just show up and you start talking to legislators and regulators like a, like a normal person and just saying, just say, this is how I, as a normal person, am impacted by this law, they listen. Because at the end of the day, legislators and regulators, they are people too. Oh, there's, there's us passing a law. Um, but anyways, yeah, that's what I was saying, like the regulators, don't, they don't necessarily see themselves as part of this grand um, 
you know, conspiracy uh, to basically kill all life and poison us with terrible compost. They, they are human beings who rely on life for their own life. And when we call CalRecycle or write to CalRecycle, our state agency, that we found them to be really receptive, in fact. And pretty much every time we've given input on some regulatory proceeding, uh, they've taken our advice. So that's kind of refreshing to not be like, completely going up against the system and hitting a wall. Uh, maybe we're hitting a little bit of a wall with the city of Oakland, but that's where some, I think, broader-based organizing is going to come in handy at some point. But yeah, just as far as the areas of law that are coming up, there's, there's laws about you know, the kind of containers you can keep organic matter in, dumpster laws, basically. And then there's laws about the transport of that material, what kind of vehicles you can use, when you can haul it, what hours, and which haulers get licensed. There's the laws around the facilities themselves, what form, what size they take, what methods they use. And then there's like the question of what you do with the finished soil. And there's actually labeling laws, testing and labeling laws that get applied to fertilizers. They're really created for the big fertilizer industries that end up getting also applied to small scale compost production. All these things that we have to navigate. Um, but it's kind of fun, really, learning about these things. I've been learning a lot about biology, actually. And feeling like there is a lot of difference to be made right now. So this is the formula, basically. I, and I'm serious about this. I kind of, I wanted to create a folder, an online folder of resources to share, which I didn't quite get to do today, but I will do. And I'll share my email address in a minute. Because if you're interested in being involved or interested in starting your own soil policy party or parties, this is the formula for it. Have dinner, it really helps. Do, you know, do something to make it fun, social. I think the nice thing about me having done these uh, for the last eight months, these soil policy parties, is I've really made a lot of new friends. Um, I'm just like sharing a lot of fun stories together. And then like doing the research, learning on your own. Make, you know, if the laws are hard to understand, that's not your problem. That's the law's problem, and that's something to fix. So just get into it, dig into it, do some problem solving with some friends. Um, freak out about it discuss, and then take action. And there's, like I said, so many ways to take action. And, um, and then do it again next month, because like I said, there are going to be a lot of laws coming down the pike that we need to be involved in. So that's my email address. If you email me, it might take me a little while to get back to you. But the reality is we're just getting started and trying to, in many ways, like build up a movement of people who are actively shaping compost law. So hopefully that'll include you. Thank you. And I, I don't actually know what time it is. Nobody's given me like signs or anything like that. But I think it's question and answer. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess come up to the microphone. I think you all probably know how it works. Yeah. Hi, I'm a farmer from Ventura County, and I was just curious. Um, you know how you're, you're talking about how we could make laws, we could push laws, we could make new laws. Uh, do you have anything drafted that um, maybe when I email you, I could like ask you? Hey, could I just get the simple, like, you know, like you have it drafted so it kind of follows the law and like kind of how they want it to read? <sighs> yes and no. Um, we've been trying to come up with some definitions of things like community scale composting, micro scale composting, because when you create new definitions in the law, then you can go and then you can ask regulators, policymakers to carve out exemptions for that. So we've taken a few cracks at it. We don't feel like it's perfect yet and we're still learning, but um, we are building up a repository of resources. Pretty soon, we actually have a website, compostlaw.org, that we're gonna start putting resources on. So thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hannah Apricot with Permaculture Magazine. Thank you so much for all your work. Um, I'm just curious if you guys know there, Christina Ricci and Christopher Walken are in production on a movie about Piercy, who went up against Monsanto from Canada many years ago with his farm being um, infiltrated by their seeds. And I'm just curious, um, so many years later, from your perspective, how much this story can still relate to the struggles that we're having today and if we saw anything come from that. Bueno, tal vez te refieres al mundo según Monsanto de Marie Monique, la francesa. Yeah. 
del caso contra Monsanto. Ah, de well, the truth that there have been so many movies, so many documentaries about it, and that one is from five years ago. Ah, this is in production. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Ah, ok, eh, yo creo que Monsanto ha, se, sigue, ha seguido operando este monopolio de las semillas y ahora la nueva fusión con Bayer es sobre todo una fusión eh, en términos de todas estas demandas que ha tenido en el mundo y de tratar de limpiar su imagen. Monsanto ha merged con Bayer y han continually been doing their monocrop scheme and they're trying to um, wash um, what their image in a, they're trying to frame their image in a better way y también eh, yo creo que el, el gran capital alemán está muy interesado Valle representa el gran capital alemán, las farmacéuticas, están muy interesadas en los últimos años en México en apropiarse de los recursos genéticos y esta es parte de la, la geopolítica. This is a big part of geopolitics because Germany, which owns Bayer, is infiltrating Mexico and trying to take over our seeds. Y recursos genéticos. And our, and just, um, resources, uh, genetic, yeah, que son resources, la base de las medicinas, which are the basis of all medicine, cosméticos, makeup, y, y, y semillas. And seeds. Okay. Finalmente son los nuevos colonialismos del capital. They're the new colonialists of our time. I, real quick question on that uh, compost um, and the idea like marine carbon project. Oh, wow, we can just, but we should go back to that marine carbon project. They used organic compost. They used very rigorous conditions. That should be the definition yeah. before you put it out on the land. Yeah, that it be organic and that, be, that the... True. They got UC Berkeley and Davis were working on that project. You got a very hard and firm definition. Yeah, I, I do hope so, but I will say it seems like the majority of the compost that is being ma made has really low quality control or high levels of contamination, so that's really unfortunate. Yeah, thanks. Hi, I am with a, a community garden in Sunnyvale, and we make our own compost on site. Are we going to be prohibited from doing that? <laughs> Not if By you start organizing. <laughs> okay, but it is a threat to that practice for us. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Well, I will, I will say the only type of composting that hasn't been threatened is when you use organic material that you generate on site, you compost it on site, and then you apply the compost on site. So nothing ever moves off the site. Okay. So, But I, knew, I know a lot of urban farmers who are gathering uh, vegetable scraps from, from restaurants and groceries, and that's where it, it becomes problematic, especially. Okay, so long as we're doing it in-house, so to speak, or in-garden, we should be okay. Yeah, that is correct. Thank you for that. That's not legal advice, but God help us.